What's up, guys? This is the Daily Dog Trainer Podcast, episode four. Four weeks in, that's a month. Man. We did four weeks of podcast. This is exciting. Um, all right, so we got a couple. Uh, this is going to be more of a random podcast. So um, last two, obviously, we had Kristen and Emily on. We were discussing Caesar's Way, did some book review stuff with that. Uh, we're going to finish out that book in one of these next coming episodes here, but we're going to kind of change it up a little bit today. I got a couple random topics to go over. I've had a lot of, not a lot. I mean, I don't want to act like it's been a ton of, you know, <laughs> notice and like, yo, do this on the podcast, do this on the podcast. Yeah. Maybe like three people. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple people reach out with some topics, uh, wanting some opinion on them, stuff like that. Um, and one thing that has kind of come across the radar recently is, let's see if I can get this pulled up here, unprepared. Where are we at? <laughs> so, so somewhere in the great, it's in great, like it's in Cleveland, right? Is yeah, it? I think it's going to be somewhere in the flats. Okay, so somewhere in the greater Cleveland area, potentially the flats here, um, they are planning to open up a dog park bar. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so basically, I was asked. What's your opinion on this? You know, dog park bar. Here we go. Got it right here. Bark and Brew. Bark and Brew CLE coming summer 2021. Indoor dog park. Self-pour bar. Dog pool. Daycare. Rooftop patio. 20,000 square feet of interactive space. Let's pull up the website here and let's dig a little bit into this. So, wait, what was it called? Man, this just says bad news. Opening opening opinions, Josh. Bad news written all <laughs> over it, especially a self poor bar. Yeah, that's bar not good. CLE. Let's see what we got here. Use the old computer. I feel like uh, I feel like Jamie from the Joe Rogan show. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Bark and brew. Yeah, I guess I should have the laptop, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. <clears throat> So Bark and Brew 2021, Splash Pad, Indoor Dog Park, Self-Pour Bar, Daycare Boarding. Okay, so looking at it, you got some pictures here. Basically what I'm seeing is kind of like a brewery kind of setting looking place, warehouse, you know, um, little dog park area. Looks like an indoor fenced in turfed area with kind of like a bar setting behind it. Uh, more coming soon, right? So there's not a whole lot of information yet as far as what specifically this is going to be. And I, we've been asked a few times about just our opinion of, you know, what is this? Why is it good? Why is it bad? How could things go wrong? What could possibly be good about it, right? There's, there's a lot of conversations to be had about this. And unfortunately, right now, with the information that we have, we don't know a whole lot about what this is going to look like, right? Yeah. So... Basically, all we know is that over the course of the last couple of years, taking your dog to breweries has become like the hot thing. It's the thing. It is the thing, right? So, 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 so with that, I feel like it's evolved from, or, or I feel like people have wanted it to evolve from, okay, cool. When I go out and have some beers, I want to be able to take my dog with me too. I want that to become like the social event for dogs right because there's been a lot of contention lately in a lot of these breweries where obviously you have to keep your dog on a leash at them right so um you know i I go to platform brewery and it's a very dog friendly and people are there with dogs all the time the dogs are on the leash and for the most part i would say it's 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 fine right you know sometimes you get dogs barking at other dogs across the way and stuff like that but it's safe it's controlled you can get your dog out with you uh and you can enjoy some drinks and and not have to leave them at home and stuff which i think is great and i've taken advantage of that plenty of times right i've taken Mm -hmm. my dogs to these breweries before and stuff as well the problem, I think, is where you start to get these lines blurred as far as people starting to think that it is basically a dog park, right? So, for example, mm-hmm. Terrestrial Brewing Company, right? Okay. Are you familiar with them? Uh, yeah, I've never been there, though. Okay. Well, you don't drink, so I wouldn't yeah. expect you to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Terrestrial Brewing Company, and again, not trying to bash on this place. Actually, the owner of Terrestrial Brewing Company just signed up for dog training. Perfect. Which is very cool, right? Yeah. So, so, I'm going to say this. As, as politely as I can, right? Because it's not that I have anything wrong with that place. I like mm-hmm. that place. I go to that place fairly regularly, yeah. right? I've taken my dogs there before and stuff. But I will say that um, 
I took my dogs there up uh, the first couple of times I went and then I never did it again. And I always tell my clients that that is not the place to take your dogs to. You want to go there, you want to enjoy the drinks, you want to do all this kind of stuff. That's great. But that was the first place I really started noticing that the lines really got blurred, right? So okay. for example, one time I was doing a lesson and we took uh, Nike, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so Nike is a uh, formerly pretty human aggressive dog right he had Mm -hmm. he didn't really have very many issues with other dogs but he was just kind of he was kind of a little bit of a butthead right so we're doing a lesson we finished his training she wanted to start working on like public access work with him and stuff because he had started doing phenomenal right and we went to terrestrial brewing company for a lesson and we were just going to work on essentially like a long down stay with him the whole time we were there right which is something that i do with my dogs i do with other clients dogs we take dogs out and about to all sorts of different places and um things are great right so i'm there we're there with nike dogs in a down there's no there's basically nobody else in the bar there's maybe like one other couple that's sitting at the bar uh i don't think there were any other dogs there and the way the place is set up it's like a big l right so the bar being the short end of the l the hallway leading to the front door uh being the long end of it so basically if you're sitting near the bar you can't see the entrance you can't see where anybody's coming in right okay so we're sitting there, and suddenly I see this dog just come flying around the corner. Oh, jeez. Right? Yeah. No leash on, right? Flying uh, around the corner, whatever, you know, being a happy little pup, just thinking he's at the dog park, mm-hmm. right? But we're at a brewery. We're not at a dog park. Yeah. Right? There, you know, there's signs posted in the place. You got to keep your dog on a leash, this, that, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I grab the dog, and I take the dog back to the owner, and I'm like, hey, Please keep your dog on a leash, right? Yeah. Like so. And listen, here's the thing: I at this point have such little tolerance for that because I think it's one of the most disrespectful things that you could do as a dog owner is mm-hmm. to go into situations before you even have walked into the place and just assume that like you basically own the place and your dog yeah. can do whatever the fuck that it wants yeah, to do. You just let your dog go, basically. Yeah. Exactly. You just let him go. It's like, hey, this is your place now. Do whatever. Yeah. Right. And again. This is a brewery first. Yeah. There may be people there that are allergic to dogs. Yeah. Right? Exactly. What about that? Your dog can't be going and running up to everybody that is is, is sitting around, right? So whatever. So I, I give the dog back to the owner. I explained to him. I was like, listen, this dog isn't that great with other dogs. Please don't let your dog come up to us. Right? And I probably said it a little forcefully. <laughs> a little you stern know. in your voice. A little stern in the voice. That's okay. You can't do it. Again, it's, it's disrespectful, right? Mm-hmm. And and plain and simple, like you, you have to have your dog on a leash when it's there. There's signs that say it everywhere. So yeah. whatever. Guy puts his dog on a leash. He's sitting at the bar. And, you know, I think maybe 10 minutes later. And, and, of course, he puts the leash on the dog, but he doesn't hold the leash, right? He's one of those guys that has the dog on the leash, Dog is just the, – the leash is just on the ground. It's just like yeah. formality. If I have to have the dog on a leash, so I'm yeah. just going to put it on. Yo, he's leashed. See? Ha, ha. Yeah. Right? So so 10 minutes later, whatever it was, dog gets up. Dog runs over to us again. Right? Okay. This time, dog comes like full speed running at us. I get up. I kind of shove the dog away before he has a chance to get to Nike. Right? Mm-hmm. And I just remember it turned into this production. Right? Oh, well. Guy gets up don't touch my dog, blah, blah, you know, turns into this this argument, this dispute, all over the fact that we were at a brewery and the, 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 because the lines got blurred and this place started to develop this association of like your dogs can do whatever here and it's the yeah. social event and you mm-hmm. can let your dogs run and play and stuff like that. Um, it, it, it turned into people would just do that all the time when they, they technically couldn't, right? So, so long story short, Created this conflict, whatever. The the person behind the bar basically said, hey, chill the fuck out, guys. Keep your dogs on a leash, whatever. We remained there for another 20 minutes and left. And basically from that point on, like I said, I always tell my clients, it's not the place to go with your dog, right? So we're going to get into here my thoughts on why dog parks or freely, you know, because you're probably thinking like, okay, well, why is it such a bad idea? that we can't make places like that dog parks and, and, you know, where can things go wrong and stuff like that. And like I said, I have some articles and I have some things we're going to discuss over the course of this as far as why, but long story short, bad idea, right? So terrestrial 
the, the where I think it went wrong with that place <clears throat> is because it's lo- it's located in Battery Park of Cleveland, right? Which is this really kind of hip new industrial area yep. where it's all townhouses mm-hmm. and condos and everybody's got dogs there yeah. and conveniently located right in the center of Battery Park is like this kind of big field that isn't mm-hmm. fenced in, but it's essentially been coined like the dog park of battery yeah. park right yep. it's 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 not a fence in area or anything but like anytime you go there you're going to see at least three or four dogs off leash running around there yep which again whatever i let my dogs off leash i don't mind that but it's still not a dog right it's still yeah. not the dog park yeah. right and, and people have kind of assumed it as that yeah now terrestrial is located right next to there mm. so basically what started happening was the people that would let their dogs run and play in the dog park would just then casually walk over to terrestrial while their dogs were still off of the leash mm-hmm. and go in. And of course, everybody thinks they have ultimate control over their dog. Yeah. So they would, it, and it just turned into a thing, right? Yeah. Where, you know, I think they did like Sunday puppy brunches up there all the time. And again, in terrestrial's fairness, they tried to do the right thing with this kind of stuff because those Sunday puppy brunches that they did, I believe were ran by different rescue organizations. I think Real Rottweiler did a lot of them up there and stuff like that, where they're trying to do a good thing. Yeah. The problem is they left out the fact that it was it, it was intended to be an off le- or it was intended to be an on leash kind of situation of a brewery yeah. that you could just go to and bring your dogs to and it's not a big deal, mm-hmm. right? Anyways, so dog parks in general, right? Typically speaking, bad idea, right? Let's go back to this place again here. Mm-hmm. All right, so we got Bark and Brew CLE, right? Now. What things does this place potentially have going for it, right? So it is a daycare and a boarding facility, right? So so what I want to know is as they release more information on this place, is this going to be a brewery that also does daycare and boarding? Or is this place going to operate like a boarding and daycare kennel that also has bar services on the side for you to come and enjoy? Because here's the thing. <clears throat> let's take miracle canine training for example let's say i wanted to start a brewery that i thought could be a dog friendly brewery but i had complete control over all of the rules and the structure as far as what was going on in it right okay. i can control that environment with the dog's best interest in mind because i know where the things typically go wrong in those situations right yeah generalizing this out even more right our daycare and boarding services, right? Those are add-on services to us being a training company first. So because of that, the daycare and boarding services that we offer are gonna be offered in a particular way with the dog's best training interests in mind, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at stuff like this, when I see daycare and boarding added onto this, the first thing that goes through my head is, listen, most daycare and boarding places are not ran very efficiently either. But they do have pretty strict rules on the dogs that they will allow in there, right? So it's not yeah. just going to be a free-for-all of, like, your traditional dog park where literally anybody that yeah. lives in the city can go to it without any sort of, yeah, like, anything rules. goes. Yeah. Yeah, right? So so that's one thing this place could potentially have going for it is if it's ran by the correct organization, they could have a very clear vetting process of it, right? So, for example, um, you know— uh, any history of biting at all right they may they may need to like pull like a county record on if there's any issues on the dog right they may need to have a daycare or a boarding trial day before you can come and utilize the self pour bar uh dog park situation right Mm -hmm. they may have other rules and stuff like that that they can put in place to make this go safely to at least try their best to mitigate issues and make sure that the right dogs are going there and the wrong dogs are not going there. Mm-hmm. Now, listen, even if you do all of that vetting process, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that most traditional daycares or dog parks and stuff like that have that go wrong with it, whether you have the best dogs or not, that again, we'll get into. But for the most part, I would say that if they have clear rules and structure on that, that's going to be a little bit less of a big deal, right? Um, So that'll be interesting to see as far as how they kind of manage that situation. Um, But yeah, I don't know. Like I said, not not really enough information on this place yet to uh, get too much into uh, exactly the thoughts on it. But I'll be interested to see as they release more. The one thing that I'm I'm very 
interested to see how it's going to go. I don't know where I saw it. It was some article that was written on it. Um, but they're trying to have like a barred like sky deck kind yeah, of thing. There's a picture of that on here. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and essentially you drop your dog off for daycare, I guess. And then you can go up to this bar and then watch over the, the pack. Sure. Which just seems like an awful thing. Cause let's say <laughs> your it's dog, like the cameras, like the, yeah. everybody wants cameras at your yeah. daycare. But I don't think people understand. Okay. If you're, if your dog starts something or gets into a fight, like mm-hmm. what's that going to look like while you're up in the sky deck? Sure. Getting drunk. Yeah. Or how, how does that look yeah. at all? If you see a dog fight, you know, Oh, this, that, I don't yeah. know. That just does not seem like it's a, a, a good thing. I understand the premise behind it, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be one of the worst things that they could do. <laughs> I, I'm really curious to see, uh, and I tried to get some information on this, but I couldn't find anything. Mm-hmm. So I know that there are other. So so going back to then, so I'm going all over the place here, but yes. you know, so we we have obviously, so we start with breweries that are dog friendly, right? That you can bring yeah. your dog to on leash, right? Mm-hmm. That started to blur into breweries that technically should have been on leash, and that were the rules, but started allowing a little bit more kind of funny business, a little bit more free yeah. for all action at them. Then the next hot trend that I had been seeing is uh, stuff like this, not to the capacity that this one is, but but just dog park bars, right? Yeah. So uh, Alex Mazurka, I remember, uh, she was in, I think, Tampa or something somewhat recently, okay. and she sent me some videos of a dog park bar that she went to that Ooh. was a smaller situation. Like, it wasn't much bigger than a lot of these breweries, but okay. they had an outdoor area where same deal. You could let your dogs out. Uh, they could run and socialize and play, and you had a bar setting as well, right? Okay. I'm very curious, one, how many of those that there are out there, I don't really know, and two, how long have they been in business to the point where, you know, have they seen any substantial incidents at them uh, that yeah. have caused them to change rules, change structure, things like that, right? Because here's the thing, mm-hmm. no matter what, Every single doggy daycare I know, no matter how strongly you try to vet the dogs that come at it, dog fights happen, yeah. right? And especially the ones that don't vet seriously enough, right, or uh, don't know what they're doing as far as understanding kind of some of the canine body language and understanding some of uh, the training side of things and stuff. When you're throwing dogs in that you don't know, that you don't have a really good way of vetting, there are a ton of daycares out there that have had dog fights break out and dogs die, right? Yeah. All you need is a tiny little squeaky dog and a big <laughs> dog come in, right, that yep. really doesn't like other dogs that you don't know that the owner's just like, hey, he's probably going to be okay. It's not a big deal. And then, boom, <laughs> dog fight breaks, and yeah. in half a second, dog's dead, right? Mm-hmm. So at these dog park bars, it just the problem with it is though I know people really want to do it, it's only a matter of time until something happens. Right. So I'm curious about that as well is how many incidents have they had at these for how long that they've been open? Because some of that stuff may only happen once a year. It may only happen once every other year. Right. Yeah. Um, good. But that's a, that's a very impactful thing. Even if it's once a year, I mean, yeah. You know, if that you happens could, one time, I mean, yeah. that's, you know, you got to look at like, is what we're doing actually beneficial? Yeah. Right. And the other thing I'm worried about with this one in Cleveland is it's so big. Like, what is it? 20,000. 20, 20,000 square feet. That's, Super big. That's a lot of room and a lot of supervision that's going to be needed. Whereas yeah. maybe the one in Tampa that she went to. Much smaller. Much smaller, easier mm-hmm. to maintain and keep yeah. an eye on everything. They probably have a cap on how many dogs are there as well. I hope so. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whatever. So so what we're going to do here is I have a couple of articles I pulled up on just – we're going to talk about dog parks in general. We're going to talk about why they're so bad. Um, and then uh, we're going to discuss also kind of the idea of how something like this could potentially be ran correctly uh, given the right organization doing it. Uh, and where I, where we think it's going to keep going wrong here. So let me pull some of these up. So dog parks. So jumping away from the brewery conversation here for a minute. So so dog parks, right? We get asked all the time in one-on-one lessons, like what our opinion is of them. Uh, should you take your dog to them? Should you not take your dog to them? How should I socialize my dog if I'm not going to a dog park? Yep. And I always say dog parks in theory are a very good idea, right? Yeah. 
our dogs need social exposure, right? We need to be able to get them out and about. We need to be able to get them around new types of dogs um, so that they can build those social skills and learn to interact and stuff like that. Um, the, the problem that goes wrong is that ultimately there is no central authority figure at dog parks. I think that's the root of the problem because all of the other minor issues you could be seeing are a result of not having a, uh, a central authority figure at the dog park. Um, but again, jumping back into all of this here, I, I think the other thing is we have to understand what's the goal with the dog socialization that we're doing with our dogs, right? If our goal is just for us of, I want to go and hang out and do something fun and be able to bring my dog with me, we're not having the dog's best interest in mind, yeah. right? If I am looking at a dog park as a situation of, I don't have a fenced in yard, and I want to go burn off some energy. So I'm going to take my dog to the dog park and throw a ball. That is not having the dog's best interest in mind either because you're not understanding what the purpose of the dog park is, which is socialization, right? Yeah. So in theory, the dog park should be a good idea because it should be a place that we could take our dog and we could let them interact with new dogs, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, at those dog parks, people are doing all of the things that get in the way of that, right? So mm -hmm. let's use the example of the ball, right? You take your dog to the dog park, and you sit there, and you throw a ball with them for 20 minutes, right? Throwing a ball with your dog is one of the most antisocial things you could do, right? Yeah. How do two dogs play with a ball at the same time? They don't. They can't. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 basically impossible, right? It's not yeah. something that they could tug on because it's so small that you can't have yeah. two ends to grab onto. Yeah. You can't have two things chasing it at the same time, or I should say they could chase it at the same time, but two, two dogs can't grab it at the same time. Right. So mm -hmm. say then, you know, you're playing this antisocial game with your dog and then suddenly another dog's like, Oh, Hey, I like balls. And then they go and run over and your dog gets it first, but the other dog is still going for it and jumps on your dog's head is there. Right. So your mm -hmm. dog is suddenly getting their head grabbed by another dog, which is going to trigger a dog fight. Right. Uh, or just the act of chasing the ball puts your dog into this adrenalized prey, prey driven, uh, high drive state of mind. That's going to create problems as well. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bad thing for it. Right. So, so I would say the, the big three things that dogs will typically get into fights over are food, toys, and affection, right? So the ball would be a toy. It's just a specific type of one that creates antisocial behavior, uh, tug toys, squeaky toys, all sorts of things like that. Again, you see owners bringing those things to dog parks all the time, uh, and it, them creating problems, right? It's just a resource. It's like, why would I, I, I remember when I first got Vera, I think I went to a dog park for like the first month that I had her or something like that. Okay. Uh, because everybody said, hey, take your dog to a dog park, get him socialized, <laughs> right? And I didn't know anything at the yeah. time. And I remember having a couple of positive experiences there, and I remember having a couple of really bad experiences there. Um, the couple positive ones were typically on the days where it was a little bit slower. Um, there would be another younger, playful little pity that she was able to run around and play with and this and that, and it was all fine, right? No big deal. Uh, I was able to have a conversation with the owner while they were doing their thing, right? And it was cool, right? couple of the more negative experiences I remember, uh, two of them that ring a bell off the top of my head is um, I remember I was there and I'm pretty sure it was like just me and some other guy and suddenly two Huskies come in and like it's, it seemed like as soon as they walked in and it was like there was that tension at the gate, which is normal, right? When we introduce a new dog into the pack, like there's that initial moment of like we're sniffing each other, we're sizing each other up. You know, things are kind of stiff, this, that. And that initial introduction process is one of the most important parts of socialization, right? <clears throat> when you're when they're going through that, that's the first step of them figuring each other out, right? Yeah. So what happens is this happens, a lot of tension going on, and the lady immediately jumps in and grabs both of the dogs by the collar and kind of picks them up and tries to pull them away uh. from the situation and suddenly right yeah all the snarly it wasn't a dog fight but it was just like it, it just created this thing yeah and i remember as she did that and as that happened she's like oh and just 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 turns around and leaves right she was just like oh this is not gonna go well i'm gonna leave right because she messed up that first initial introduction process to it yeah. right now that was a minor incident nothing happened it wasn't a big deal right mm -hmm. uh but nonetheless it shows you that two things one those dogs probably were fine, but the owner didn't understand them well enough to put them in a situation 
uh, where they were going to socialize properly, right? Point number two, um, those dogs and that owner, um, she didn't have any control over them. So she wasn't letting them socialize in the way that they needed to socialize. Um, and, and three, that situation could have gone really, really poorly, really, really quick with the wrong dog. Luckily, my dog and the other dog that was there was relatively good, right? They didn't have any very many uh, social issues or anything like that. So it was just kind of like they were like, oh, whoa, I'm getting out of here and kind of took off, right? Second incident, I remember I was at the same dog park, and luckily this one didn't involve my dog. And I remember it was on like a Sunday or something. Everybody kept telling me when I was going up there, you know, the Sundays are the best days. They're the busiest ones. Everybody's off work, this, that. And I'm like, oh, Mm -hmm. great, cool. I'm going to go up there. I get up there. This place was bumping man Mm -hmm. it was packed there was dogs everywhere in it and uh i I think i was there for like 10 minutes something like that i may have had like a friend meet me up there that had a dog too all right and we're there and suddenly boom huge dog fight broke or broke out kind of on the other side of the dog park Mm -hmm. i think all i remember seeing was there was a rottweiler there was an owner jumping in and going to grab a dog and stuff like that and i remember we just got out of there yeah dipped out and i don't think i ever went to a dog park again after that right (laughs) now this was one of the smaller ones uh i've heard of situations like this happening at say lakewood dog park all the time lakewood dog park is probably the more popular one around us uh from a like actual city dog park basis right um and you know that place you could drive by is you could see 30 40 dogs in there at any given time like it gets really busy and it's not a big place like honestly i don't think it's that much bigger than our facility is um so whatever so so they're not great right food toys affection people are there with toys all the time they're throwing balls they're bringing their favorite squeaky toy with them which especially if it's your dog's favorite squeaky toy you better believe they're gonna be more likely to guard that thing than not yeah you have food right the amount of times that I've seen at dog parks, people just with the, the treat lady that just has the bag of treats oh, that's yeah. just handing treats to every dog that comes up to them <laughs> all the time, right? For sure. Uh, and affection, right? The amount of times that I see people just going up, or I should say saw people when I used to go to them, uh, but still, no, obviously people do this because they try to do it all the time at the facility. Definitely. They, they go over and they're trying to hug and kiss every single dog that they see, mm-hmm. right? And the problem is that all three of those things create resources that dogs are typically going to fight over. They create competition amongst those dogs, which you don't want when you're socializing dogs. And they take away from the goal, which is dogs learning to socialize with each other, right? Yep. There's a reason why when we're doing socialization with new dogs or we're doing daycare or whatever it is at the facility, we have some concrete rules in place, which is no food out, no toys out, and ignore the dogs. Our job is lifeguard at it. Because it allows for proper social skills to develop. Um, so the central authority figure is what all these places are going to lack, right? The daycare setting, um, the um, the uh, dog park setting, or these brewery type settings. Is there's not one person that can say, you're allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this. You're allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this. So in any of those the owners all have to assume that role of their own dog, but nobody else's. So everybody is essentially interacting amongst different rules, which again, Mm -hmm. creates problems. So um, to further elaborate on the point of why dog parks are so bad here, I have a couple of articles we're going to read through here. This was from a quick Google search this morning of just dog park incidents, right? And these are some kind of extreme examples, but the problem is These examples I'm going to read are the examples that are all over the internet. Like, I could have pulled up 25 of these in, like, just a minute, right? Yeah. So, go ahead. Well, and I was just going to – I'm sure we're going to get into this, but it's kind of the points that we've even had in, like, Caesar's book is just everyone thinks that they just know exactly what they need to do for their dog. You know, I have my dog's best interest in mind, and I know how to take care of my dog. And now you times that by 20 or 30 people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just a, it's a terrible mix uh, yeah. because everyone's got an ego. Yeah. You know, like I know how to treat my pit bull. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing with your dog, obviously. Yeah. You know? It's crazy. Like, I feel like this is, <laughs> this podcast is going to be like the sassy episode. You yeah, know, probably like, this is not so, and, and this is the thing. This is not so much the like instructional like let's go and learn something this is for me to really really reiterate my point of why some of these things are so bad 
right? Yeah. So so here's the thing. So first one, this is from KGW8, which is, uh, where is that out of? Rock Creek, Oregon. So okay. article headline, family warns of dangers after dog attacked and killed at park. Okay. Uh, a veterinarian said dog on dog attacks are very common during the summer. A Washington County couple is grieving the death of their dog after he was attacked at a local dog park. He was a great dog, and everybody loved him, said the dog's owner, Jim Stewart. Which, listen, I feel bad for them. <laughs> yeah. If my dog got killed at a dog park, I would be pissed off. But this this is just going to show, right? People not understanding their dog. Everybody thinks, like you were just saying, mm-hmm. their dog is perfect. Now, here's the thing. This dog wound up dying, which is not good at all. But here's no. the thing. He may have played a contributing factor into this whole incident as well, yeah. right? And it may have also happened from a fault of the owner not understanding their dog and putting their dog in a situation where something like that was going to happen, right? So exactly. we have to look at this, and we have to be able to identify where the problem is coming from. So on August 3rd, Stewart said he took his Cocker Spaniel, Nikki to the dog park next to Portland Community College's Rock Creek campus. Stewart said he had just walked Nikki through the gate on a leash when a group of dogs came up to sniff him. Going back to the one incident that I had, that entry right away is one of the prime spots that you're going to see issues come out. My dog was just standing there, almost frozen, and then just growls and dust. Here's what probably happened. Exactly what I described, right? So owner walks up with dog. Dog's probably a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. There's a group of dogs at the dog park. And as opposed to doing what we would typically do, which is let the energy level die down, let the dogs kind of interact through the fence for a little bit and get a read on the situation, then let the dogs in in a calm manner. What he probably did is he just walked in, dragged that dog in, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of tension, a lot of tension. And the dog's still on a collar. So he tries to pull the dog through, which then triggers a fight response out of the dog because anytime you're using a leash and you're applying tension what's typically going to happen is you're going to amplify the situation and then boom dog fart break dog fight breaks out and guy still got the dog on a leash so he probably tries to pull the dog away which then turns things into a chase game which i mean obviously like like this is a serious situation this dog died right but but you see how quickly that can escalate if you don't know the situation, as opposed yeah. to, let me explain how I would have done this situation. And I'm not saying that this wouldn't have turned into anything, but I, you better believe that if this situation happened at the facility and I did this introduction in a very particular way, there would have been no problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe a sure. little snap, maybe a little growl, something like that, which is normal. But a fight would not have broken up from that, right? Yeah. So here's how we typically do this. And here's the thing. If you go to dog parks, you'll notice, just like we have at our facility, there's a double gate situation, Mm -hmm. right? Now, that's typically for safety purposes, right? That's typically for the purpose of, um, you know, being able to go in, close that one behind you, and open the next one so that if a dog kind of runs through, it's it's not the end of the world. They're not going to go anywhere. But we could use those to our advantage when we have dogs that are fearful by putting them in a situation where we don't have to drag them into the group because that's where, again— when you're dragging a dog that's nervous into a group of other dogs, you're immediately escalating that situation and you're creating arousal and you're creating panic in the dog that you're bringing in, which could trigger a dog fight. It doesn't always, but uh, with the wrong dog, it can. So using those, what we would have done is I would have walked into that center area, closed that gate behind me. I would have taken my dog off of the leash or just dropped it. If you want to have the leash on still, that's fine. But I would have sat there while all the other dogs ran up to the fence line and I would have just waited. I would have waited until that initial rush of, holy shit, there's a new dog here. We got to go check him out, whatever. Wait till that dies down. Let him sniff through the fence a little bit. Let him kind of get used to each other. See throughout that process, are you going to see any sort of reactivity or are you going to see any sort of aggression? Because that's one of the prime places that you'll be able to see, is there going to be a problem before you actually bring it in? Because, uh, you know, through the fence is not the best read because naturally barriers can create problems, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about that before, leashes fences, windows, doors, stuff like that. Any sort of barrier can create uh, conflict sometimes. But if you see a dog that through that fence line is snarling and biting at the gate or growling or whatever it is, you know that that's a dog you have to keep your eye on, right? You know that that's a, you know, this is a situation they might not do too hot. If they're already doing really poorly through this fence, once I go to let them in, you know, I need to make sure that I'm going to have some control over that dog. And here's the thing, in a dog park setting or in this dog brewery setting or anything like that, you don't have control over the dog because there's no central authority figure because there's no training involved. Yeah. Right. So say we're doing this at Miracle Canine, bring the dog into that double gate, 
let the dogs run up to the fence line with that excitement of, hey, there's another dog there, which is normal, guys, right? It's normal that all the dogs are going to be like, hey, there's something new here. Let's go check it out. Let the energy level die down to a moderate level, and then all you do is you open the gate. You don't drag your dog in. You open the gate, and what, what's going to happen is one of two things. Your dog's going to walk in, and they're going to be able to do that introduction process, or the other dogs are going to go into that exterior area, and they're going to sniff your dog, which is going to then push your dog into the main area, which then you could close that door behind you, right? What you've immediately done is you've reduced the arousal of the situation, right? So we're not just rushing right in while all the dogs are still all pumped up. We've addressed if there are any preemptive signs that we need to be aware of if there's any issues with dogs and then we've opened the door and we've allowed for a natural introduction to start right from that point you just supervise you walk in and typically what I'll do is I'll walk straight to the middle of the play yard I'll walk straight to the middle of the dog park um, and what that's going to do is kind of pull all the dogs in with you and get you out of any sort of pinch point situation and then from there like I said you may see some growling you may see whatever, your dog get a little uncomfortable and kind of try to scurry away or anything. But I, <laughs> I hate saying this. Nature will kind of take its course at that point. Yeah, <laughs> It sounds stupid, but it kind of will, right? Once you've done your part of setting up that scenario to go as best as possible, mm-hmm. nature will kind of take its course at that point, And they're going to kind of figure it out, assuming none of the dogs have severe aggression issues. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good point where you say you walk <clears throat> directly into the middle because i right think into the middle a lot of the times people are like, stand there yeah ah. and they or they just kind of <laughs> shuffle to the left or the, to the right yeah, like yeah. on the fence i need a i need a gif of you doing that shuffle the shuffle the sh- oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> but you know like yeah because you, if you just shuffle to the left and you're still on the fence well like you said there's a pinch point what if your dog tries is trying to hide behind you yeah. and now it just is getting suffocated by all the other dogs 100 percent. you know <clears throat> and and I agree with all your points, obviously, because it is such a powder keg moment of just getting there. And do you want to make it explode or do you want to just diffuse the situation? Diffuse the situation a little bit, right? And again, even when we're, I mean, you saw us do it numerous times in daycare where we let, you let it chill out a couple minutes before you let the dog in, right? Yeah, exactly. It could be the most playful, best dog. All of those dogs could love this dog, but just let the energy level come down for a minute before you do it. Right. Yes. And then again, just don't worry about the stiffness and everything. They're sizing each other up. They're checking each other out. They're seeing, you know, what, what they're all about and stuff. And that's normal. You got to be aware of that. Yeah. And I, I think another point from the very beginning of it where you said, you know, they thought, oh, mm-hmm. it's the sweetest dog. It's the best dog ever. And I, I think people get so worried about the other dogs that they don't. They're so defensive too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they don't realize what their dog is doing. Yeah. You know, they, sure. they just get blinded by, oh, my dog's fine at home mm-hmm. or whatever. And they look at all the other dogs, but they're not looking at their own. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and again, you know, there's something to be said about when, when you have those kind of really strong emotions about your dog, which listen, we all love our dog. Yeah, we, love we dogs, do. Right. But when you really have that feeling of like your dog is the sweetest, best, never could do anything wrong kind of yep. thing, you're going to be so much more hyper defensive about them in those types of situations. And I'm sure the second you see any sort of like conflict, <laughs> right, yeah. you're going to be jumping in and making the problem worse typically. Yeah. Or like how they said, oh, oh, like my dog would never do that. Like the sweetest dog. So sure. He, I'm sure in their mind, my dog did nothing Yes, in that in that position. Yep. So anyways, moving on here. Stuart said a German shepherd attacked Nikki, critically injuring him. They took Nikki to Bethany Family Pet Clinic, where veterinarian Dr. Mark Norman began treatment. Norman said it was a scenario he's all too familiar with. We typically see a couple dog park, dog-on-dog attacks every week in the summertime, said Norman. It's very common. Most dog parks, including those in Washington County, are unregulated. No central authority figure. <laughs> Oof. Owners bring their pets at their own risk with reasonable expectation of injury, according to Deborah Wood, manager at Washington County Animal Services. We just never thought something like this would happen, said Jan Stewart. Dr. Norman said a lot of pet owners don't realize the risk. He said learning to recognize a dog's body language is critical, especially at dog parks. A dog's intera- or a dog's actions may be interpreted as play when really it's really showing aggression, and a lot of times they're misinterpreted by the owners, said Norman, or the other way around which I think is way more common than not because I've never needed to say when two dogs were playing to an, I probably need to say, but I've rarely ever needed to say, Hey, that's not actually play. That's aggression right there. You need to be aware of it. Right. What I find myself needing to tell them all the time is, Hey, that like, 
growling noise and all that kind of stuff. They're just running around, having a good time, competing with each other, playing, mm-hmm. the mounting, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about it, right? Yeah. And too much micromanage on that kind of stuff will create the fights as well, right? Because you're not yeah. letting the dogs go through that natural cycle of socializing and figuring each other out and figuring out, you know, play, what is play? Two dogs trying to figure out more dominant than the other. Or play is two dogs trying to figure out who is more dominant than the other without actually fighting, right? So so, so that's what I see more times than not. Where I see the other, where a dog's actions may be interpreted as play when really it's showing aggression, uh, and a lot of times it's misinterpreted by the owner, is I see that stuff with humans all the time, right? Mm-hmm. I see the, my dog's licking my face, or all of my guests that come in, they're pawing at them or trying to crawl into their lap and this and that. And people are like, he just loves them. He just loves new people. New people are the best. He just wants to give them all kisses and hug them and jump on them and wrap his arms around them and this and that, right? When in actuality, those things are hardcore competition with humans, which that we do not want, right? Mm-hmm. Those things are dogs trying to control humans. And the more that dogs are trying to control humans and learning that the things they do can elicit responses out of humans, the more you create a confident dog that's going to be more likely to bite. So that's where I see that happen, not so much in the play setting. I see the opposite with play, which creates more problems, typically at dog parks. You see micromanaging all the time, right? Yeah. Well, I was going to – how how do you think we got to that point, like, as owners, that we can't let our dogs just naturally socialize? Like, even if there's one little growl <laughs> sound, we just have to stop it. I, that's a good question. I think that – I think a lot of it has to do with – First and foremost, the over humanization of dogs, right? Yep. And thinking that, you know, just like with kids, that we need to communicate different boundaries and expectations and micromanage and this and that. Mm-hmm. We need to do that with our dogs, as opposed to understanding that, though we may be able to do that somewhat effectively with kids. And I think that's even a conversation of like, how much do you need to <laughs> micromanage your children? Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that our kids can at least understand us, right? Yeah. They understand the point we're trying to get across mm-hmm. and we can communicate back with them, right? Yep. In a dog setting, we can't do that, right? So because we've overly humanized, we think that we could communicate with them effectively. And we talked about this with the Caesar stuff. My dog gets me so much. They understand what I'm telling them and this and that when they actually don't, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one side of the equation. Uh, I think the other side of the equation is – I mean, I think think that's the biggest one is is the humanization part of things – I think the other side of the equation is because of that, there's there's just not enough education on what play looks like, True. right? Yeah. Frankly, frankly, because we're overly humanizing them, we see the more extreme versions of what can happen when play goes wrong, right? So yeah, like okay. dogs yeah. dying and, and, and getting severely mauled and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. those are like, unfortunately, kind of regular occurrences now. I mean, you probably just like this vet saying, but these vets probably see that shit all the time. Oh, yeah. Right? Um. So, so, so I think because, and then because it, it goes in a cycle, right? So then because we've seen those more extreme examples because of the humanization, we humanize and micromanage more, yeah. which creates the more intense situations, which, you know, and it just goes yeah. around and around. It's a vicious cycle. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the point I try to get with people. And then on top of that, going back to the brewery conversation and stuff, we're putting our dogs in way more social situations than we probably used to. Right. Definitely. All of my friends, I feel like growing up that had dogs like listen, I I never had dogs growing up. So I don't have a whole ton of firsthand experience as far as what living with a dog was like 20 years ago, you know, 25 Mm -hmm. years ago. Um, But I did know a lot of people that had them and those dogs didn't go and get play dates all the time and stuff. Yeah. You know, like if you had a family dog, did you have a family dog growing up? Yeah. Well, it's a little different for me because I grew up on a farm. So they're just outside dogs. Yeah. So, so. Talk about that for a little bit. What was growing up with a dog like for you? Well, for me, they were. It was just almost like another stock animal. You know, it was just part of being on the farm. Like we just had the dog. We had a, a dog house, which everyone now would be like, "You have a dog outside in the winter? How dare you?" But yeah. I mean, my whole life we had dogs, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, mm-hmm. whatever. But yeah, they were more looked at as an accessory i guess not an accessory but like tool kind like of. a tool maybe yeah. yeah to keep things out of the yard and sure. stuff but it wasn't a oh you're you know such a good dog like you Did know Did they come in know. the house and stuff no 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 they they were like not part of the family <clears throat> yeah you know I, I guess that's sure quote unquote you know like yeah they were our dogs we loved them but mm-hmm. 
there was like always this disconnect for me that like, oh, it's just a, another, it's just a dog. Yeah. You know? So my, my, <laughs> my experience might be a lot different than people that are going to listen to this podcast because like maybe not for you, but sure. most people in the Cleveland area, if you had a dog, it was a pet. Yeah. But even that, I mean, I think there's something to be said about, you know, so people nowadays want the dog that, um, you know, just kind of like we, we call it that protects the house and this and that. Yeah. You know what true. I mean? Like, like, and, and I don't mean that in the, they want a protection dog kind of way. I just mean yeah. that in the sense of they kind of like when the dog barks, when people are coming up the driveway yeah. and, and, and they want the dog to live that kind of normal, like life. Yeah. Right. The problem is because they're humanizing so much and because their their relationship with the dog is so much different than it used to be, that mm-hmm. can't effectively happen. Where, you know, I feel like maybe 20 years ago, if you had a dog and if you really had that balance of, <clears throat> you know, the dog is not – it's not a family member. You know, it's like it's a pet, yeah. right? It's, it's not a human, right? Because you weren't doing all of those other things we talk about, like we talked about in Caesar's Way stuff um, – if you live that life of letting your dog do those other kinds of things, because you still had that, that distinction between you're a dog and I'm a human, it wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah. Right. There was less competition between humans. They would still bark at them and they would still protect the house and do all those types of things, but not in this like malicious, I'm used to competing and being over top of humans all the time kind of way. Yeah. Right. There were still boundaries. Yeah. And I mean, even if you go, if you think about, you know, like in the, the fifties, sixties, 70s Mm -hmm. i mean if you even look through like movies and media or tv shows i just think dogs were just there like you didn't take your dog that's a good point you know you didn't watch like i love lucy or something right? some of those old like uh, specials and there were a lot of times dogs in those families but back then you didn't have you didn't take your dog out you like you took them on a walk yeah that was like the most other than that it was probably in your home all the time sure so i think yeah, you know, those eighties, nineties is when you started to see them like the dogs being brought out all the time. And yeah, now we've just evolved more where they're an integral part of our lives that they have to go anywhere we go, yeah. you know? So I think it's just been a, a cultural difference. Yeah. Cultural change. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, okay. Where are we at here? I keep losing my link. <laughs> Let's get back to finishing this guy off here. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Everything stems back to the way you're living with your dog. All of this stuff is not training related issues. It's just understanding your dog better. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, knowledge, the stu- okay. Yeah. So dog's actions may be interpreted as play when really it's showing aggression. And a lot of times they're misinterpreted by the owners. Knowledge, the stewards hope will do for other pets, what it can do for their own now. Uh, yeah, basically, they just go into just be really careful at dog parks, really, really careful. Uh, Wood said, normally, uh, Washington County Animal Service does not get involved when there's an injury fight at a dog park. However, he said, because Nikki died from his injuries, Washington County Animal Services should and will investigate the situation, whatever. And, and here's the thing, and this is the really fucking sucky part about this is, you know, if I were in a situation where my dog died from something and I wasn't educated and all this kind of stuff, I would want, you know, justice to be paid and all of that. But yeah. you have to look at, you know, a Cocker Spaniel is not a very big dog. German Shepherd's a bigger dog. You know, it sucks that the dog died, but like it might, it's not, it's not, you know, it, it's not like you can't point that blame on one individual person or no. dog or thing. Right. Nope. So, you know, whatever. It's just an entire sequence of bad decisions. Yep. All right. So getting into the next article here. So this one is. Uh, this one is written by, I believe, yes, a this is this one is written by a veterinarian, right? So this one is Dog Parks Danger Unleashed. Uh, tr- tr- I know great title, yeah, right. Danger <laughs> Unleashed. I noticed a mounting body count of injured dogs coming directly to the emergency room from the nearby dog park. On the surface, it's hard to take issue with a dog park. It encourages dogs and their owners to go out and get some exercise, fresh air, and sunshine all the while strengthening the bond between them. With our fractured modern lives and a spreading epidemic of human and pet obesity, not to mention apartment dwelling, it seems like a made-to-order cure for all, or for everyone involved. (laughs) I love this person already. Yeah, she's she's digging on everyone. She's hitting the nail on the head. Listen, (laughs) humanizing, pet obesity, human obesity, like there's all this stuff going on. We're we're living differently with our animals, Mm -hmm. right? It seems like a made-to-order cure for 
uh, cure all for everyone involved. It is hard to find fault with the, oh man, she uses some big words here, idyllic image of dogs romping and playing, tails wagging while their owners chat over the small details that make up their lives. When I first got out of veterinarian school about 15 years ago, this was my impression of dog parks. Uh, Wonderlands where forest creatures could romp and people could reconnect with their pets and each other. You could practically hear the choir singing their tiny castrati tunes. I was a big proponent of them and talked them up to everybody until the bodies started coming in. She really went for some <laughs> some dramatic effect with this. Listen, she's not wrong, obviously, but no. like, <laughs> like she's going this, for the dramatics with it. I appreciate it. I mean, you know? I think people need to hear it kind of like that, though, yeah, yeah. you know? She's not sugarcoating anything. <laughs> yep. I have a lot of clients that are veterinarians and or or vet techs i would say vet techs honestly more so i think mm -hmm. vet techs have all of the knowledge that a lot of the vets do with a little less of the ego definitely so they could talk about this stuff a little bit more freely <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit more openly and they they talk about this stuff the same way this sounds dramatic but like when they tell me about shit that happens that they see <laughs> like at yeah. their vet clinic or whatever it is they're not sugarcoating anything no mm -hmm. different than you know it's funny kate she's an emergency room nurse right mm -hmm. and the stories she has and the things she tells me about the people that come in and, you know, the, the different types of injuries and, and stuff that they need to do and stuff like that. Like, people that work in that kind of environment where they're seeing, like, the roughest of the rough, whether it's injuries or types of people or whatever it may be, um, you become almost so calloused up to it that you, you kind of become pretty harsh about those things. Where yeah. It's like, listen, like, this is a problem and you guys aren't realizing it, right? Well, I'm sure that's happened to you enough as a trainer. Yeah. That you get... 100%. These questions, you're just like, why do people have that yep. mindset? Mm -hmm. uh, my first job out of school was my internship year at a busy emergency and specialty hospital in California's midsection. After a bit, I noticed a mounting body count of injured dogs coming directly to the emergency room from a nearby dog park. Actually, injured doesn't quite convey the carnage. Torn up. I, I don't know. The, she's using all these words eviscerated and maimed all come a little closer <laughs> to describing the victims of dog on dog violence that I saw on an almost nightly basis during the warmer months. The stories from the owners of the injured were almost always the same. He was just playing when this huge dog came out of nowhere. A bigger dog picked him up and shook him like a chew toy. This massive dog just swooped in, bit him and ran off. I didn't see an owner anywhere. That's another big point with dog parks is I've seen, I remember when I used to go to the dog park and I've had clients tell me, some people will literally take, you realize some people will literally take their dog to the dog park, put them in the dog park and then go do something else. That's insane. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> I've, I've, I've genuinely seen that before. Um, uh, uh, particularly at the dog park that I used to go to. It was in Tremont. It's uh, the Clark Fields dog park. It's not there anymore. They're like renovating that park or something. But people would bring their dogs and they would put a couple dogs in the dog park and then they would just go just go somewhere else, do like, something else. Like, do you give a shit about your dog at all? It's just that <laughs> mentality of, again, it's fine. It's no big deal. They're going to be cool. Whatever. <laughs> The victims were almost always smaller than the attackers, and Yorkies and Bichons seemed to be the most common targets of the larger aggressors, a condition known in the, in the professions as Big Dog, Little Dog, and abbreviated BDLD. BDLD oh. is what we would write on our dry erase incoming boards when we got the call that a case like this was coming in. The only abbreviations that would strike more fear in our hearts were HBC, hit by car, GDV for gastric dilation vulvis or bloat, which I dealt with that, that fucking sucked. Uh, ABC for attacked by clowns was a distant fourth. A little comical uh, twist there. Dang. The injuries sometimes incurred in just a few seconds would be horrendous. The trauma massive. Many did not survive or were euthanized due to the finances involved in even attempting to get them better. It is shocking how much damage a set of jaws can do in such a short time. 30 seconds of fighting could lead to weeks of recuperation, multiple surgeries, and thousands in medical bills. Many of the odors became victims themselves, usually bitten on the hand or arm as they tried to wrest their smaller pets from the jaws of the larger dogs. The Center for De Disease Control and Prevention reports that 885,000 people need medical attention every year for dog bite injuries. It was sometimes hard for me to tell where the blood was coming from, the owner or my patient. I often informed pet owners of the nature of the dog's injuries and then sent them packing to the ER for treatment themselves. Okay, so a couple things here. 
So first off, going to the BDLD, the big dog, little dog here. Let's talk about why that is so common, right? Because she is right. I mean, that is like, if especially with dog park injuries, I would assume is the majority of them is a little dog getting severely injured by a bigger dog. Yeah. Now you could talk about first and foremost, how, you know, the, the damage is just because of the fact that the other dog is so much bigger, which is true. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously it takes two seconds for a large dog to break a smaller dog's neck than it does for that to happen with two bigger dogs, obviously. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it has to do with two other things here that I feel like I've seen. So, one of those being that little dogs resemble toys, right? Yep. What kind of toys do we typically play with our dogs with? Squeaky toys. Squeaky toys. Right? What types of noises do little dogs that are panicking make? Squeaky toys. Squeaky toy noises. <laughs> so when they're making these squeaky toy noises, what we've done by playing with a lot of these toys with our dogs is we've conditioned them when they hear these noises to bite down harder, right? So mm-hmm. they hear that noise, it triggers arousal, it causes dogs to go after it right? Mm -hmm. Now you could train that out of your dog. That doesn't necessarily mean just because you're playing with squeaky toys that your dog is going to attack little dogs or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not the, I'm not the biggest believer that like you should avoid those toys altogether, obviously, though I don't really give them to my dogs myself. But I think that there's something to be said about a lot of the toys we're playing. If you're struggling with other issues in your dog's day-to-day life, you have to be aware of those things. Ball chasing, right? Or chasing any sort of toys, right? tapping into prey drive that's what that's the state of mind they're in when they're chasing a ball and if you're struggling with a dog that chases down squirrels and chases down other animals yeah, and bites them that. and kills them and consumes them that squeaky toy or that that chasing of the ball is putting them in that same state of mind and you're technically kind of teaching your dog to rehearse that behavior right yep so that's one thing here uh The squeaky toy, obviously, if you're having issues with smaller animals, that squeaky toy can create more intense aggression towards that type of thing. Uh, And then the other side of the equation is with little dogs, when they get in, they're, they're typically carried all the time, right? So because they're carried all the time, they tend to have the worst social skills because they're never in a place where they can actually interact with their surroundings or other dogs properly, right? I've seen people literally take little dogs and hold them like babies in front of other dogs before to have them introduce, right? Yeah. I've seen people, as soon as the little dog starts acting up or getting scared, they just pick up the dog and carry it away, right? So you're creating these poor social skills with these smaller dogs, which are going to turn into larger problems in like dog park fight situations or social situations or any of those types of things, right? Um, I think that the last side of that equation is that we we don't understand them well enough where we look at a little dog like it's different than a larger dog. So because of all of those other things that we're doing, we're essentially creating a dog that is 100% dependent on us. So we see little dogs tend to guard those resources like the most, right? So like people, for example, their owners, and they will be the ones typically that initiate that fight, right? So, um, (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's that's a whole other conversation about training with little dogs that we have to have. And one of these days, we're going to get Bridget on here. The there little, you go. Little dog queen. The little dog whisper. Yeah. <laughs> Bridget, one of my employees, has like seven little dogs and runs that pack like a beast. So yeah. we're going to have to well, do that. Go ahead. Well, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, you always hear, oh, little dogs have Napoleon syndrome. Sure. You know, like the – the small dogs are always have a chip on their shoulder and they have a bad attitude. And I, I think it's more addressed to what you said, how you treat that dog. Now it's just this pampered little thing that anytime anything it doesn't like happens, you whisk it away. Yeah. You, you pull it out of that situation. It never gets to actually work through anything. Yep. So it just goes into this little rage mode because it doesn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, Going back to one other part of this here, so we have, um, you know, the owners getting injured breaking up dog fights, right? So let's talk for a hot second on that here. Okay. So that is a very common place that people are going to get bit, obviously. You know, redirected aggression is, like, the most common thing out there. Basically, what redirected aggression is is when a dog is in, like, a high state of drive towards whatever, right, whether it's reacting at a fence or leash reactivity on the leash or fighting another dog or whatever it is, basically they're just going to turn and grab whatever comes near them, right? Just out of like almost like a self-preservation defense mechanism that they have. Mm. So, so how do we break up dog fights safely, 
right? You have two big types of dog fights, right? You have the dog fights that are basically just the squabble that's a lot of noise and rolling around and stuff, but it's not like that serious of an issue. Yeah. Those ones, I'll be honest, I found you're going to be more likely to get bit in than the more yeah. intense ones just because things are moving so quickly that like you're just going to wind up in that mix and get bit. I've gotten bit personally breaking up dog fights before that were like that, right? Um, so how do you handle a situation like that? So let's say dog fight breaks out, a lot of noise, a lot of sound and stuff. Our instinctual response is just to jump right in and start grabbing stuff, right? Yep. Which I get, right? Like we want to avoid as many injuries as possible. We want to end it as soon as possible, right? The problem is by doing that, you're not thinking you're going to put yourself in the middle of it. You're going to get bit. So what you got to do first and foremost, is you got to take two breaths, right? Step back, look at the situation, see what's actually happening, assess where are the dog's mouths at, assess is somebody latched on to somebody yet, right? Do the dogs have collars on? You know, what, you know what's, what's the situation look like? When something like that's happening, if two dogs are not latched onto each other, if you have two people present, ideally, I would have two people jump in and I would have one person grab one dog, one person grab the other dog. And what you could do is one of two things. If they have collars and if you can grab a collar effectively, if you have enough of a visual of it, grab the collar, pick up, move away, right? Uh, if they do not have collars on, the safest way to do it is likely going to be grabbing the back legs and kind of flinging them away, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they call it like the wheel, wheelbarrow method and stuff like that. They always say that that's like the easiest way to break up a dog fight. That's the easiest way to break up a dog fight that is not yet latched on, right? And this is mm -hmm. assuming the dogs aren't trained. If, if they're not latched on and you have like remote collars or something like that, typically a knee collar correction will get the dog to disconnect. But if they don't, you're kind of out of luck with that. So... Uh, the picking up the back legs is effective because usually they can't swing around enough to be able to actually land a bite at that point and then kind of flinging them away from the situation, right, uh, is going to kind of catch them off guard and just like stun the dogs for a second where you then can like jump in and regain control, whatever. Second big type of dog fights you have are the more serious ones where the ones where a dog is like physically latched on to another dog and whether they're latched on and shaking or just latched on, whatever, um, those ones are the ones where I see the most damage happen. And those are the ones where when I have people call and say, Hey, my dog attacked another dog and it was really bad. Uh, you know, I couldn't get them apart. I mean, I hear all the time. I mean, I, I have people that call me and they'll be like, I tried everything. I was punching the dog. I was kicking. I was doing everything that I could. And I couldn't get my dog to let go of this other dog. The problem is, you know, listen, pit bulls don't have locking jaws. They just have very powerful jaw strength, which is why it seems like that. But dogs, once they've latched onto another dog, it is very, very difficult to get them to disconnect. And what tends to happen is once that's happened, we jump in and we try to pull apart, which is where all the damage happens, right? Yep. That's where all the tearing and the ripping and all of that happens. Um, and they just try to regrip then, which is where they'll let go and kind of jump back forward and grab again. And it turns into a hot mess. And listen, a lot of these dogs are so physically tolerant where you could do anything to them in that moment. They're not going to let go, yeah. right? I mean, you know this by experience because you've done bite work. I mean, you know how much. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. How... I know this by experience by breaking up dog fights like yeah. that, too. Yeah. <laughs> you but, know? Like... You, you know, like, once <laughs> once they're committed. Yeah. I mean, they're on it. Yeah. There's nothing pretty much you're going to, you yeah. can do physically to yes. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the problem is. Well, not the problem. The, 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 the thing is, when you look at a situation like that where a dog is latched onto another dog, the, it sounds weird, but, like, you kind of start to hit a point where, assuming it's not a little dog that's going to get shaken and, like, their neck broken or something, mm -hmm. you kind of have a lot more time than you do in the other ones because once they're latched on, there's not going to be a whole ton of additional damage by additional puncture wounds and stuff, yeah. right? So, again, taking a second assessing the situation and then immediately what you want to do is you want to stabilize and then you want to get the dog to release their jaw right you don't want to pull them away at all right so how do we do that right so stabilizing first what i found is that if you straddle on top of the dog if the dog has a collar on and then what you do is you take your two hands you grab the collar and then while you're straddling the dog to get them to stop moving around you physically pick the dog up by the collar off of the ground to the point where their feet are completely off right 
Once their feet are completely off of the ground, essentially what you're doing is you're choking the dog with that collar until they need to get more air and they let go of their mouth. And typically it's a very fast process, right? Yeah. When I've seen dog fights like this break out, I jump in, you straddle, you pick up, three seconds later they release their jaw, the other dog runs away, and you have much less injury than if you spent, you know, 15 minutes trying to fight with the dog and hit them and get them to let go any other way, right? Um, I, I was at a buddy's house that got a new dog and the dogs had gotten into a little squabble before and it was a big fight that a lot of, you know, emergency vet visits. It was just a mess, man. And I remember I was there and we're sitting there and I was there for like 10 minutes and boom, dog fight breaks out. Same deal. Jump into action, straddled the dog, picked up by the collar and the dog let go within like two seconds and the problem was over. Right. And we were right back to normal then again after that. Now, again, we don't want to have to break up these dog fights, but inevitably, if you're going to be putting your dog in social situations, there is a potential and an inherent risk you're assuming that something like this is going to happen. You have to be aware of those things, right? So anyways, two types of dog fights. That's how I typically will go about breaking those up, right? <clears throat> so back to the article here. Let me get it pulled up. Any comments on that, Josh? I think you hit the nail on the head on that one, honestly. I mean... Man, this is a this is going to be a weird podcast, I think, because I, I think a lot a of this one. is it's just, man, it's this is this is the ugly side of dog ownership, right? You yeah. know, we look at dog ownership and we think the fun, the playing, the toys, the cuddling on the couch, the kisses, all that kind of stuff, you know, and the training process and playing with other dogs. But listen, dogs are animals, man, and uh, th this kind of stuff is is. <laughs> It's a very real part of dog ownership, you know? Yeah. I mean, people <clears throat> people need to take more time on yeah. this part, though. We need to talk about the ugly side of things a little bit as stuff like... And this is all sparked from these dog park brewery things popping up, which, again, I'm mm -hmm. not trying... I personally think it's a bad idea, right? If you want to take your dog to it, you take your dog to it. That You know, you can do what you want to do. But, but this is from my experience. I have seen dogs that have seriously hurt other dogs before. I have broken up ugly dog fights before, right? I've gotten bit by dogs doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen all of this stuff firsthand to the point where like, I'm calloused up to it, where if something like that happens, like at my buddy's house, I could jump right in and get that situation solved and, and, and you know, fixed immediately. But I've seen people freeze in those situations. They don't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. And it just gets worse and it turns into a problem. And, and the amount of times I've had people call me and, and tell me situations like that where dogs killed another dog, right? Dogs severely bit, you know, this person or done this or done that. It's just, it's not good. So anyways, back to the article. So needless to say, my initial enthusiasm for the playful uh, environment of the dog park began to erode around the edges I bit. Uh, the edges I bit. I saw owner after owner and pet after pet traumatized when an afternoon's romp in the grass turned deadly. That is not to say that I think dog parks are inherently bad or people who frequent them evil, but there's no denying the dangers unleashed when dogs' uh, ancestral instincts to chase after smaller prey take over. Not every owner has a well-trained and well-behaved companion, and you need to learn how to look out for the other guy and protect your dog from injury. I still think there is benefit to dogs and their people of getting exercise and commingling. How can we resolve this conundrum? How can we keep people and pets safe while still getting the maximum benefit out of a dog park? Now, here's the thing. Just avoid them. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how you do it, right? <laughs> Your dog doesn't need as much socialization as you think where you need to go to the dog parks, right? Find yeah. a place you can let your dog run around a little bit and stuff. If you want to utilize a dog, like there's some dog parks out there that not very many people go to that you could find plenty of off times where nobody's in the dog park. And if you need a fenced in area to throw a ball for your dog to let him burn off some energy, that's fine. Um, but here's the thing, just set up play dates, right? Mm -hmm. You know, find a good structured doggy daycare. And I say this one with a lot of caveat to it because most of them suck, right? Most of them are ran by dog lovers who are the same people that you would see at the dog park. So there's a mm -hmm. central authority figure there, but not the kind of central authority figure that actually knows what to do, right? Yep. So you find a training company that does socialization, that believes in proper socialization and understands how to do things safely and has a track record of working with dogs in a successful manner with socialization, right? Um, but here's the thing. Your dog doesn't need to interact with dogs every other day. They don't need to interact with dogs every week. Uh, they just need to 
kind of be a part of things and, you know, and, and just have a couple of dogs that they could have a social outlet with, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's a big thing that you just said. Uh, a lot of people feel like they need their dog to be around other dogs almost 24-7. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you, you've had some of those people in the past where it's daycare every single day, mm-hmm. every, every 20, day. 24-7. Yeah. And, and listen, again, if you're in the right environment, that could be okay. But even the idea of bringing your dog to daycare every day, right? I have some clients that we don't do daycare every day, so they can't do it at ours. But I have clients that go to other daycares that tell me, you know, we take our dog three, four days a week. And their mentality is not necessarily that the dog needs to socialize three, four days a week, right? Their mentality is more so like, hey, I need to get them out of the house. They need to burn off some energy. I work really long days at work, this, that, which I get, you know, I, I think there's workarounds to that as well. But um, that can create problems, right? Even if you have a, a really social dog, right? I, I would say that, you know, I don't love going out and socializing with people all the time, but like, I would say that I can successfully socialize with people without getting into uh, fights with people every time I see them. But if I'm yeah. going into a busy social environment every single day, I'm going to burn out from that very quickly and I'm going to start getting cranky. Yeah. Well, I, you're like my dog, Bender. Um, he goes to work with Devin. Yeah. But if he, if he does more than two days mm-hmm. in a row, he gets cranky and like he'll sure. just sit in a corner and he doesn't want to be there yes you know it, he just gets burned out from all the mm-hmm. the stimulation and the activity yep. so she'll leave him home yep and i think people get worried oh oh he's going to be in a crate or whatever for mm-hmm. hours but your dog's probably going to sleep the whole time because he's so exhausted yes. from the two days or whatever from the rest of the the week that you had him in daycare i i don't think it's such a important thing that you need to be there every day unless you know you do work a 12-hour shift or something and you have these limitations where you have to take them man even somewhere. that though like yeah you know kate's a nurse she works 12 hours it's true three days a week uh before we were living together there would be days that deli sat in a crate for 12 hours that's true you know listen i mean it's not ideal i'm not recommending that you create your dog for 12 hours every day mm-hmm. but listen if it happens two days out of the week three days yeah. out of the week as long as you make sure that you're adjusting the dog's food and water schedule for those days and making sure you're exercising them the day before so that they're nice and burnt out, it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah. Gonna, they're they're going to be okay. You know what I mean? They're yeah, no, that's that's true. You're, so you know, if you got a puppy or something that might be a little different, you can't do that. But an adult dog, they can go extended periods of time. How many times have you, know, have you slept in for 12 hours and the dog slept in for 12 hours yeah. with you without going to the bathroom? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, yep. I'd say it's probably happened before. Maybe not all the time, but... They can definitely hold their bladder for that long. They'll be okay. So anyways, we'll get into her points here. We'll talk about those a little bit here. I think they're good points. I think the key here, though, is I would probably just avoid those dog parks. I really Mm -hmm. just just don't think they're a good idea. So number one, know the dogs who they are. I know this isn't always feasible, but if you know the temperaments and dispositions of the dogs uh, your dog is playing with, say from prior arranged play dates, you are that much less likely to come away unscathed. Um. That's accurate. I always say, if you're going to set up play dates with your dog, um, make sure it's with dogs that you know and trust. That doesn't mean that they need to have all of this training necessarily, right? Though that's ideal. Uh, but you have to know that they're at least social with other dogs, right? Know the lay of the land. Are there spots where dogs can interact and possibly get injured that are out of your line of sight? If trouble occurs, is there an easy exit? If badness happens, are you ready for it? Be ready for things to go wrong and be ready to act if they do. Now, Know the lay of the land is good, but not necessarily for these reasons. I'm not looking for a quick exit route. What I'm looking for when I know the lay of the land and, and, and say, the environment is I'm looking to see that there's not going to be um, resources and stuff laying around. You know, did somebody leave a bag of treats on the ground that could possibly cause a fight or a toy? Um, is there a bunch of pinch points I need to be aware of, right? So, uh, you know, is there is there little corners and tables and stuff dogs can hide under and kind of perceive that as territory they'll want to defend? Um And if there are, how do I kind of maneuver in a way where I'm making sure I'm not creating that? So we talked before about when you bring the dog in, going straight into the center of the area. Mm -hmm. Um, I do that to make sure that I'm putting the dog in the least vulnerable position. I always want my dog to feel like fight or flight is an option, specifically flight, right? If they get stressed out by a scenario, they have to feel like they can move away. And one thing I remember uh, uh, a trainer out in Los Angeles, Gary Cesar, said one time uh, (laughs) was – 
you know, people go to dog parks and they just sit there and twiddle their fucking thumbs in one spot. And they <laughs> sit in that same spot the entire time. Yeah. And the dogs sit in that spot with you the entire time. And all you do are just creating little pockets of territory, right? Okay. Little pocket of my territory here, a little pocket of my territory here, a little pocket of my territory here. And then anytime another dog comes into that, you're they're that much more likely to defend that spot. So if you're doing socialization, we don't really sit down a whole lot when we're doing it. I try to, if I notice a bunch of dogs packing up next to me, create motion, move around, kind of break that up a little bit uh, so that I'm not creating those pockets of territory. So next thing, watch. This may be the important one. This may be the most important one of all. Watch what your dog is doing and who they are doing it with. Keep track of the action and be ready to swoop in and break up a fight if you need to. A can of pepper spray, a container of water to throw on heads, or a big stick to pry a dog away from its victim can save a life. If there's a fight, grab the attacker by the back feet and pull him out of the fight. So we talked about that one. That's only if the dog is not latched on. If you do that while they're latched on, you can do more damage. Uh, if you have a smaller dog who is romping with a bigger dog, stay alert to the possibility that the play may turn in a direction you don't want it to. If there is a dog who you don't know who is showing extra interest in your smaller dog, pick your dog up and head out. Do not pick your dog up. Okay, so 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 this is <laughs> that is also number one place dog fight happens, right? Yep. You go in, you physically pick up your dog, which makes your dog more likely to react, which also turns your dog into a fucking toy. Yep. Right? We talked about this. Yeah, we just talked about The reason about why your these bigger dogs tend to think that these little dogs are the ones that they're going to go after is because they think they're toys already. They're making noises like a toy. So yeah. now you're picking it up like you would play with your yeah. dog with that toy, yeah. causing the dog to jump up and try yeah. to bite it. Like like, oh, you're about to throw this thing. That is the worst thing that you could do. Do not do that. Do not yes. pick your dog up. <laughs> you know, get them, you know, leash them up, walk them away if you want to. Or listen, here's another one. If you're ever in, and listen, I recommend you just don't put yourself in this situation to begin with. But if you're in that situation, where's that dog's owner? Hey, do you mind grabbing your dog real quick? Do you mind calling your dog over to you so that I can get my dog out of here? I, I have to leave and I just don't want to create any sort of conflict or anything. Communicate, right? Mm -hmm. Even though there's no central authority figure, you could still kind of like... Yeah. You know, manage shit a little bit to make sure yeah, that it doesn't exactly. turn into any problems or anything, right? Uh, similarly, if you notice a dog owner who is not paying attention to their dog, realize that could be recipe for disaster. Don't toss your dogs in the melee and wander off. If you're there to protect, or you are there to protect them from harm, um, yeah. Watch, obviously, very important. As far as the pepper spray, the container of water, those are kind of old, tried and true methods that sometimes will work with less committed dogs. Um, you could try them if you want to. I, I just, I haven't found them that effective, honestly, yeah. though. Uh, four, small is beautiful. <clears throat> a smaller park with less potential for huge roiling masses of dogs is safer than a large one in which large groups of dogs can group and set off the pack mentality. Similarly, a smaller group of dogs is easier to monitor and watch over than a pack of 50. Try going on less traveled days and less busy times of day when the crowds are smaller. Avoid extra hot days to stay safe from another killer heat stroke. Um, yeah, small groups are good. Some dogs do better in smaller groups than larger groups. The problem with the larger groups is, um, you know, dogs have to develop individual relationships, right? And if there's 30 dogs and none of those 30 dogs know each other, they're all going to be trying to develop that relationship over each other, which is going to get in the way of, you know, two dogs can't do that at the same time, right? So yeah. it's not like, hey, I'm going to go interact with this dog for a little bit, and then I'm going to go off and interact with this dog for a little bit, and then go do this one for a little bit, and then this one for a little bit. It, it, it's There's no balance amongst the pack, right? There's competition everywhere because nothing has been established yet. Where in our daycare setting, even though we have 30 dogs there, most of those dogs know each other at that point. So yeah. we only at any given time ever have like two or three new dogs in the group, right? So they can develop those individual relationships, but it's not like all of them are needing to do that at the same time. Yeah. Consider the alternatives. I like this one already. Although some municipalities provide parks specifically for small dogs and puppies, if you have a small dog, understand that the dog park may not be the safest place to take your dog for playtime. Consider a get-together at your home with dog-owning friends with dogs of known temperament or a stroll with just you and your dog. Doggy daycare can provide a safe place to play and socialize. Not necessarily. Doggy daycares and dog parks, very, very similar. Uh, properly socialized dogs can go a long way towards minimizing the risks of a dog park too. Make sure your dog has had good dog manners by enrolling him in good training program once he's old enough. And ask your veterinarian for pointers on socialization and resources for good classes. Don't ask your vets. Vets are not dog trainers. 
Dog trainers are not vets. I do not give medical advice to my clients. I would hope my veterinarians do not give training advice. True. If you own a dog who has aggressive tendencies, don't go to the dog park and expose others to the risk. Funny you should say that. It's a good idea. Whoa. <laughs> not every dog has a suitable temperament for the dog park. Before you go, be sure your dog is comfortable with dogs he doesn't know. Once there, avoid situations that may set him off. In this way, socialization benefits everyone. Less chance that a little dog will get bitten, less chance that a big dog will do the biting, and you can and you get to keep your hands. Win, win, win. Most of the above tips boil down to logic, attentiveness, and a strong sense of stewardship. Do all that you can to keep your dog from falling prey to another dog at the dog park and to keep your dog from becoming a predator. Your family veterinarian also has resources for you to keep your dog safe and certainly has the knowledge and skills to help uh, if they do become injured or ill. Uh, on another note, if you are going to take your dog to the dog park, make sure they have completed a full puppy series of... Vac- all right, yeah, get, get them vaccinated. Make sure they're vaccinated, pre-planning, blah, blah, blah. Good article, okay? So so it points out a lot of known risks. This one was very centered around small dogs at dog parks, but all of this applies to bigger dogs as well, right? Uh, oh, yeah. You know, obviously you have the prey-driven aggression that you'll see of dogs aggressing on little dogs and we talked a little bit about the whys behind that Mm -hmm. but big on dog big dog on big dog aggression bd bd you know (laughs) um that's very real as well Uh, and it happens in all the same ways uh and it's interesting you go into the comments of this um and and you just see uh everybody talking about all this stuff all the same you know this Mm -hmm. this one this is exactly what happened to us today at will's dog park para tuscaloosa Alabama, our 45-pound dog was attacked by a much bigger dog, setting off pack mentality. The aggressor had our dog down biting. Our dog ran with seven coming after. Uh, Luckily, our dog came to me, and I stood with our dog between my legs against the aggressor and pack. I yelled. The aggressor and pack would not back off or leave. I swatted the aggressor's nose, and only then did a woman who owned the dog engage yelling at me, Do not hit my dog! (laughs) I've seen that one a lot of times, too. Your dog is attacking. Uh. This is another problem, right? People don't think that their dog is doing something wrong, but it's like, hey, your dog, I, I got rushed by an off-leash dog that looked like it was going to come for me uh, at Edgewater one time. Yep. Somewhat re- actually, somewhat recently. It was right over the summertime. Dog had his bull mastiff there. This was a large dog. I watched this dog individually run up to three groups of people, jump all over them. And again, this is like a 150-pound dog. This is a big dude. It's a right? big one, yeah. And uh, guys, I don't know, very far away from him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I see this dog, I'm working with a dog that's not very great with other dogs. Dog rushes up to us immediately upon the dog coming at us. I swat it in the head to get it to stop. And I'm standing between the dog and the dog that I'm working with. Um, the guy came over, leashed up the dog and literally I thought, I think we all thought he was going to punch me. Like it was, it was insane. Like he's screaming in my face and stuff. It's just common sense guys. Keep your dogs on a leash. Make sure they're not running up to other dogs. Be safe about your social interactions. You have to be aware of this stuff. Yeah. Um, At the end of the day, yeah. you can't trust anyone but yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So all these, all, all of these comments, I mean, tons of situations here of bad stuff happening with other dogs. And, and I could read these all day. I have a bunch of other ones that I kind of notated, but for the most part, I mean, you just want to avoid the dog parks. I say all of this stuff because we're hitting a point now where these dog park breweries are going to become very popular, I think, right? Which is mm-hmm. going to, I, you know, I don't know how popular dog parks themselves are still. I feel like my clients talk way less about them. And I think that we've done a relatively good job of educating uh, the general populace of why they might not be the best. Um, so so I'm not sure, how, like, you know, I don't know how busy they still get like they used to, mm-hmm. but... I think that when we start moving in this direction of dog park breweries, I think it's going to start to get very, very popular again. Yep. When people have that ability to take their dogs somewhere like that and have them run around and play with other dogs while doing the things that they would already be doing, yeah. I think I think we're setting ourselves up for a potential of a lot of issues, you know? So, uh, you know, talking about all this kind of stuff, we, we just want to be aware of them. Um, I'm going to read one more of these here. Okay. So can we take a quick five before we get yeah. into it? Yeah. All right, Let's pause. Rolling. All right, we're back. Quick break. Had to put a new battery in the camera here. Uh, so I believe we were about to jump into one last example here of the dangers of dog parks. I think we're just going to call this podcast episode Danger 
dog parks or danger, something like that. Danger dog parks. Yeah. Death at the dog park. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to come De- up with some sort of clickbaity name for Death it. Death at the dog park. <laughs> Danger on the dance floor. Oh, Lord. Wasn't that some sort of death course, song? Probably. All right. Last one here. Slow jo- – and I – actually, I'm going to I'm gonna start this one off. I am – I picked this one because this one explains very, very clearly the point of not knowing the other dogs at the dog park, right? Okay. And, um, you know, we talk about that being one of the big issues is you don't know the dogs that are going there. You don't know their past. You don't know how social they are. And you can only go so much off of what the person says. So we're going to read this one here and talk about that a little bit. So slow justice for Murphy, the 18 pound dog mauled at the DeWitt Township Dog Park. All right. Nine months after the horrific mauling of an 18 pound dog at DeWitt Township's dog park, the wheels of justice are turning slowly for the family of Murphy, the beloved Havanese who died after the attack. Christina McRae of Okemos, the owner of Luke, the Great Dane Bulldog Mix that attacked Murphy, has been charged with five misdemeanors in Clinton and Ingham counties. McRae said Luke was euthanized in January, but not until after court records show he, vol- show he was involved in another attack. Murphy died July 8th after Luke charged across the enclosed area in DeWitt Township's Padgett Park and clamped down on Murphy's torso. Both dogs were off leashes inside the dog park. Murphy's owner, Steve Curtis, was at the dog park with his wife, Colleen, and two other larger dogs. Steve Curtis frantically tried to free Murphy from the attacking dog's mouth. As his wife screamed, Curtis remembered trying to pry the dog's big mouth open without success. Then he pulled his nose, which made him let Murphy go. This wasn't fight. This was a kill, Colleen said at the time. The small dog had broken ribs and... Actually, let's stop for a second. (laughs) Yeah. We got a lot to unpack there. So so here's the thing. So, So a fight... Or a kid. There's not really a difference. No. When dogs are fighting, they are typically fighting with the intent of killing, right? Yes. That That is kind of, I mean, when dogs get into fights with each other, it's not just like, hey, we're going to get in a little fist fight and then get up and walk away from each other. You know? Yeah. It, it's typically at that point, like it's a battle of survival, right? Now, the only way I would agree with this is prey drive related things. Dogs that have prey drive related issues to other dogs, like they are attempting to kill and eat that thing, right? Yeah. So... I don't know if that was necessarily the case in this, but a fight is, you know, always has the potential of that happening. That's so kind of how can't nat- say that they're two different. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's how nature works. Yes, they don't just fight to fight. Usually, it's- yes. <laughs> the small dog had broken ribs and a punctured lung. Steve Curtis made the difficult decision to euthanize him that night. He was six years old. All right, here's where we get history of complaints. At first, Steve Curtis said he was hesitant to press for Luke to be euthanized. McRae had said that it was the first time Luke showed aggression, but after Curtis discovered a history of complaints in neighborhood neighboring Ingham County su- suggesting that wasn't true, he changed his mind and asked for the township police to press for euthanasia. DeWitt Township filed two misdemeanors against McRae in October. They are still pending, though. A plea argument is set to be heard April 26th. She's charged with having a vicious dog and a dog that destroys property, the property in question being Murphy. This is another part here that people need to kind of understand is dogs are only viewed by the law as property, right? It doesn't matter how much of a relationship and this and that. In the end of the day, even going into like Sue in these types of situations, yeah, all you're going to get is the value of the dog, which is not very high, you know? Yeah get in the conversation of like i guess i can understand like in a situation like this as we read further along you'll see like pressing for the euthanasia i guess um but you know frankly like outside of that there are not a lot of benefits to trying to press charges in any sort of like dog on dog related incident yeah <clears throat> so both carry penalties of up to 500 dollars in fines and 90 days in jail the charges against McRae were still making their way through Clinton County District Court when Luke pulled out of a harness on a walk and attacked a neighbor's dog, Malachi, in December. Malachi's owner, Sherry Wolk, was injured. She declined to be interviewed. Ingham County filed three misdemeanors against McRae in March, which are pending. They are for owning a dog that bites a person, that person being the owner of the other dog, uh, owning a dog with vicious tendencies, and for owning a dog that causes malicious destruction of property, all through three carry penalties of up to $500 in fines and 90 days in jail. Malachi's owner also filed a complaint about Luke more than a year before Murphy was attacked. In that case, Luke jumped a fence and attacked two dogs, leaving minor injuries in that 2017 complaint. The neighbor said it was the second time it happened. So we have a dog here. 
that has had, what is that, four individual incidents with other dogs, right? Mm -hmm. All of which, and here's the shitty part about this, right? All of these might not be true inherent dog aggression, right? All of these individual things are barrier frustrated responses. Aside from the dog park one, we're not really getting all the information of obviously, but a lot of these are barrier frustrated responses. Fence, right? Let's use the jumping the fence and attacking a dog that happened twice, right? I've seen so many dogs that people call me and they're like, my dog just gets so worked up at the fence. Neighbor's dog comes out, they just go over there, they freak out, freak out, freak out, freak out. If suddenly that barrier gets removed because of all of that arousal, that energy in the way that the dog goes at the other dog can trigger a dog fight, even though that dog may be the most social dog in the world. The harness, slipping out of the harness and attacking the other dog. Same concept, right? Reactivity, 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 which we've talked about this plenty of times before. Reactivity does not equate to dog aggression, but the energy associated with the reactivity can turn into a fight. It could trigger a fight, right? Yeah. Dog's reacting at the leash, freaking out, slips out of the harness, suddenly runs over, and then boom, triggers a fight, right? Um, That stuff happens all the time, and those are the training-related issues where we look at these situations and we think, we can manage that, right? I could just make sure that I have my dog on three harnesses and leashes so that they can't get off of it. I'll build a taller fence. I'll do this. I'll do that. Right. As opposed to stopping those problems. If you reduce all of that arousal and, and, and those issues, the dog is probably very social with other dogs, which is probably why the owner was led to believe they could take the dog to the dog park. You Mm -hmm. know, if they, I would say most people, if they have like a really, really inherently dog aggressive dog, they're probably not going to avoid situations like that unless they're completely delusional. Where this person is delusional is that they saw all of the precursors of how those issues can turn into dog fights, and they did nothing about it. They didn't seek yeah. any sort of training and stuff like that. And because of that, it turned into the dog got euthanized over it, right? It mm-hmm. got put on the dog, even though you got to accept that responsibility of I fucked up also, right? I didn't do anything about this situation, which led to that point. Exactly. So, you know, long story short, you know, this one, little dog gets killed. We find out that this dog has had multiple issues with other dogs in the past, even though as a trainer, I could look at them and dissect them as these are probably training related issues, not necessarily socialization related issues. The owner did nothing about it. They said here, you know, we tried to cover the vet bills and do this and do that. We paid all this money to do that. But unfortunately, they didn't do the thing that the dog really needed, which is (laughs) <laughs> this, this is a quote from the owner. I found out the hard way I cannot handle a large dog, an 80-pound dog, she said. You didn't train the dog. Of course you can't handle a dog yeah. that weighs almost as much as you. You need to train the dog to stop those issues. Uh, she said she now has two dogs, but they're smaller than Luke. I'm doing everything I can to be a perfect dog owner. I love dogs, and I will make sure this doesn't happen again. You training the dogs? Probably should be. <laughs> Steve Curtis said the family still misses Murphy. He said that the fact that the attack occurred in one county and McRae lived in another made it more difficult to pursue the case. They did, I guess, what they could do. It took a little longer, he said. Uh, Colleen Curtis said she's still studying dog parks to make recommendations how to change to what counties, uh, townships, dog park. One idea is to prohibit younger children in the dog park for their own safety, which probably is a good idea. I mean, uh, you know, having kids amidst dog fights is probably not a great, great yeah. move. Um, Andrew DeWitt's township manager said the township is open to ideas for the dog park, including a segregated space for small dogs, more trees, and a fob system allowing access to the park. So creating regulations and stuff for it, I think would be good. You know, listen, the small dog park, I think can be beneficial if you have like a really little dog and you're nervous around having them other dogs, but I don't know. I mean, it's at the end of the day, the issue here, I think that all this is stemming from is No central authority figure, nobody there to explain how to do things properly, nobody there to tell people when their dog is being too much or kick them out if they're being too much, Um, too much looseness from the owners and them, not knowing the other dogs that are there. I mean, there's so many numerous problems with dog parks, and we just scratched the surface of it. Literally this morning, I just sat there, and I was like, I searched incidents at dog park, and like, just, I I was just scrolled through like three pages of them to try to find like ones that felt like they... Uh, we're going to be good to discuss on here. But, like, I could have pulled up 25 of those in half a second. You know yeah, what I mean? exactly. Um, it's it's just not a good idea. Now, I'm not – again, I'm not saying we don't have dog fights. Miracle Canine has dog fights, right? They happen. Inevitably, when you're putting dogs together, there's going to be dog fights, right? Um, but y- – you do to some degree accept the risk of if you're going to socialize your dog frequently, there's a potential of something happening, but you also have to do your part to make sure that you're minimizing the chances of that happening 
as best as you can, right? And as long yep. as you're doing that, that's all that you can do, right? Aside from just isolating your dog from other dogs. So how do you socialize your dog and how often do you socialize your dog? So how often? Not that often. Once you've checked the box of your dog is social, they have good social skills, they're okay with other dogs. Once a month, I don't know, you know, something like that. Get them around one or two other dogs once a month. Have, have Make sure they have at least one friend they can go and interact with and play with and stuff, whether it's a daycare setting or whether it's, like I said, a friend that has a dog that you know and trust. Uh, how to socialize your dog. First and foremost, you got to train the dog. I always say anytime with any do- when you get a dog, you have to train the dog, right? Just to avoid issues, period, right? But Anytime you're putting your dog in a social situation, whether with people or other dogs, and you don't have complete control over that dog, you're essentially, fingers crossed, hoping everything goes good. Once you have training on your dog, you can communicate effectively. You can make sure you're mitigating problems as they come up. You can make sure that things just go well and you you can communicate how you need to with them. So train the dog first. Make sure that you're doing the slow introduction process like we talked about if it's going to be in like a play setting like that. And that's for... That's that the one I hope is beneficial for people that go to parks. I hope that one is beneficial to people that are running doggy daycares and stuff, letting the energy settle down before going in. Make sure there's no food, toys, or affection, the three things dogs will typically fight over. Make sure you're not creating any sort of territory. So if dogs are bunching up next to you, start moving around. Uh, ignore the dogs completely and solely play lifeguard to step in and handle things if they happen, right? If you do those things, you're chances of it going successfully are going to be much higher. There's going to be much less risk associated with it and you should be good to go. So last notes on that dog park bars, just avoid them, avoid them. Bad idea. All right. I want to give you a scenario. Okay. I'm ready. And we've, we've pretty much covered how you would go about it, but I think it'd be good to just give you a scenario and then people kind of, hear your answer on it so someone this is like a personal uh, friend of mine lives in downtown philly right Mm -hmm. the closest thing is a dog park other than that it's like a 25 minute walk to get to a regular like you know recreational park what would you do uh in if it was your dog or if it was in your situation how would you socialize your dog if there was only a dog park and maybe not a a daycare like at hand that's close by? Well, yeah. I mean, like we talked, does he have friends that have dogs? Yeah. You know, you could set up a play date with them. Just make sure you're doing it in this somewhat open area. It could be inside of somebody's house or something. Right. So that's one. Two is if it really is that convenient for you to go to the dog park, I would say I wouldn't do it for socialization purposes. That one I'm never going to recommend. Yeah. But if you want to do it for the purpose of just burning off energy and stuff, go on off times, you know, and then if you see somebody coming in, just leave, right? Yeah. Um, or if you need that open space for you and your friend to socialize your dogs, you could utilize the dog park for that and just make sure that you're, you know, going there when nobody else is there and then leaving if people start coming in, mm-hmm. right? So you could utilize it to your advantage, Yeah. right? But it doesn't need to be used the way that people say where you go there and let them interact with dogs that you don't know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then the last thing is like, does a person have a car? Like downtown, you know what I mean? Like downtown Philly is not like, it's, it's not like it's like New York city or anything. Yeah. Right. Like if you have a car, go drive somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, definitely. But, but outside of that, you know, you could, you could utilize it for the purpose of exercise, right? And you could utilize it for the purpose of having an extra space that's, you know, that you can let your dog off leash safely and stuff, but you just got to make sure you're doing it at times when nobody else is there. And then you got to make sure you're leaving when other people are, are coming in, you know? Yeah. I just thought it'd be good to put it in like a scenario form for some people, sure. you know, like if that's all you have, you know, just be very mindful of it. Like you said, for sure. And you can still use that space. Yeah. But. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I have clients that still use dog parks, right? Yeah. I give them my opinion on it. And for whatever reason, you know, that it's the same deal. In my, their mind, it's the only place that they could really do it effectively. Right. Yeah. And, and if you're going to do that, you know, again, I don't recommend it, but you just, you have to be aware of the things we talked about. You have to be handling situations the way that we talked about here. And you have to kind of take that ownership of trying your hardest to be the central authority figure that it needs. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, just like dogs are uh, more or less dominant than other dogs. People can also assume that role. Right. Like if I were to go to a dog park with some friends or if I get together with some of my friends and they have dogs and we're going to let the dogs together, 
I'm going to kind of just inherently assume that role of communicating boundaries and, and communicating with the people, making sure everybody's on the same page. Hey, listen, you know, if, you know, if somebody's trying to give your dog treats or something, hey, you know, please don't do that. Or, uh, hey, do you mind not throwing that ball right now because it's just going to create this kind of prey-driven mentality in the dogs, right? You can communicate these things. The only thing you have to be aware of is since you're not technically the person that's in charge there, if the person says no, you can't do anything about it, yeah. right? So, um, you know, if you're going to do it, you, you just have to understand how to do it properly. Yeah. I think that's the key with it. Okay. Here's one more scenario for sure. you. Uh, let's say you're opening, opening a brewery or a restaurant with a nice outdoor patio sure. and you want to have it be dog friendly. Mm -hmm. What are some tips that you would give to a, a business owner to have that as an integral part of their restaurant or business? So, so first thing I would say is training for staff, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I go to breweries, one thing that I hate is when staff members will just come over and start giving the dogs treats or petting them or interacting with them without asking, right? Yep. And this is for everybody. This is common sense for everybody, yeah, definitely. right? Now, I don't recommend, again, going up and just <laughs> petting dogs that you don't know, right? Yep. For obvious reasons. But if you're going to do it, just fucking ask, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, how hard is it to be like, hey, can I give your dog a treat? Mm -hmm. Hey, can I give your dog, uh, can I pet your dog, right? Can yeah. I do this? Can I do that, right? So so train them first and foremost, ask, right? I'm not going to even say don't do it at all, even though that would be my recommendation if I owned it, right? Yeah. But at least ask. The amount of times that I've just been looked directly through and just, <laughs> just right at my dog and they just go for it and I have to be like, hey, stop. Like, yeah. don't do that, right? Yeah. It's abs it's absurd, right? It's it's yeah. and it's disrespectful, right? It really like it, it really is. Like especially, you know, dogs are property, right? We just talked about that yeah. in this. That's how they're <laughs> viewed. So what you're just saying that you own my property and you could do whatever you want with my property? Yeah. That's that's rude, right? So really so is. first thing, education for staff, making sure that the staff understands specifically what to not do, right? Yep. Yeah. So uh, second thing I would look at, I think this one gets, gets, gets looked past very frequently, spacing of the tables, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's a huge one where, you know, you ha if, if, if it's going to be a, a pet friendly patio and we're in a room like this, that's only like 20 by 20 and I have tables every three feet away from each other, which you can't do that now because it's obviously a pandemic. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, true. But, you know, you know, back, you know, when, when things are kind of normal and stuff, if they're really close together, you're setting up all these pinch points. Right. Yeah. Are, are the, you know, is there enough room in the aisles for your staff to be taking drinks and food and stuff through? Uh, are they spaced out far enough where each dog can kind of have their own little space and not have to worry about other dogs coming in and stuff? Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing I would probably look at would be um, making a rule as far as what types of leash your dog is allowed to be on in it. Right. True. Your dog has to be, or better yet, have a specific radius that your dog needs to stay within, right? So so if your dog is on a flexi lead, your dog, I guess, can be on the flexi lead, but it has to be shortened enough where yeah. it can't get within that other table's radius, Yeah. right? And however you want to do it, you have to set a rule making sure that other people aren't going to be being, you know, owners aren't going to be being rude by just doing whatever they want with other people's dogs. Exactly. Staff is not going to be being rude by just bringing your dog treats and stuff like that without asking you for it. Uh, and then owners are not being rude with their dogs by letting their dogs just go up to everybody's space. Yeah. Right. So I would be aware of those things if I were doing that. For sure. And I think uh, that's the problem with maybe terrestrial. Um, sure. You know, they were probably pretty good about it, but you know, you get people pushing and pushing. I don't think it's pushing. their fault. It's not their fault. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, they, you know, they're trying to do a great thing. And again, I love that place. Right. Yeah, same. Um, I think that, um, I, I think you're right. I think it was the pressure from a lot of the people around. And let me also say that since the pandemic, I've been there a decent amount of times and dogs have been on leashes every time. Yeah. So I think they've definitely cracked down on that, which, yeah. which I appreciate. So, yeah, it's just a outside source that yep. it's just, it's just hard to keep people accountable because people yep. are stupid. <laughs> That's just what it comes down to. The general dog owner is not very aware of these things. I think exactly is, is the nicest way to put it. Yeah. So. It, it's, it's actually kind of astounding because a dog is such a big thing, like a big responsibility. Yeah. But I feel like there's such little time put into taking care of your dog. Like, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. doing any research at all. Yeah. It just amazes me sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, just being aware of those things. Uh, just socialization, man. Again, talking about the ugly side a little bit, this one, because it's important as we're moving in a direction of uh, involving dog on dog socialization into more of our lives. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of socialization. I love it. It's something that we've really specialized in at the facility, but um, you just have you have to be aware of those things if you're going to be uh, doing that type of stuff. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. I think we are. Let's see where we're at here. 145. It's a good one. It's that perfect length. Good podcast. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about us, Josh, where are they going to find you? Josh Dobe Productions on Instagram and Facebook or my website, joshdobeproductions.com. Nice and simple. Uh, David the Dog Trainer on Instagram. Um, Miracle Canine Training on Instagram and Facebook. My business, if you're interested in learning about behavioral rehabilitation, daycare and boarding for our clients, any of the training services that we're offering. Uh, and then obviously, miraclecaninetraining.com has a list of all of our services, our rates, things like that. Um, we're open to more suggestions of what to talk about. So hope you guys like this one. If you need anything, give us a look.